Today I propose to cover the constitutional law, bringing the essential facets, the principles and the essential uh, information what a healthcare professional is expected to know. To begin with, whenever we talk about constitutional law, in any country, if you take note of, constitution of that country is considered to be the basic document. The fundamental document of a, any country is called the constitution. In a given situation, in a given country, it may be a written and a codified constitution. Like in India, we have the constitution of India, which is a written constitution. Every article that is written and reduced. And accordingly, we have articles, schedules, sections, etc. There are some other countries where the constitution is not written but it is understood in the form of conventions, traditions and practices. The best possible example is UK, where the constitution is not written one. American constitution, it is a written constitution. In that way, constitution which is considered to be a fundamental basic document of any country is, I mean, very significant when we talk about the legal and judicial system. There is a difference between constitution of India, the document, constitutional law. Constitutional law means the law which governs, which is related to the constitution. Okay? Constitution of India is a document which has its own perspectives. A political perspective is there, an economic perspective is there, a social perspective. There are so many perspectives, including legal perspectives. When we say constitutional law, we are going to discuss the legal aspects governing or relating to constitution of India. Am I clear? Okay. Now, the first important thing is, whenever we talk about constitution, you know, constitution of India came into enforcement, indicating, reflecting the ideals, the aspirations of our freedom struggle the independence movement. The enforcement of a constitution of India indicates that the country is independent in a sovereign manner. That is the reason why four guiding principles have been enunciated by the constitution of India. What are they? Sovereign, democratic, republic and secular. I repeat once again, sovereign, republic, democratic and secular. Socialist, the word socialist was deleted by 1942nd Amendment Act because of various political reasons, etc. But at the same time, the Supreme Court of India made it very clear that it is always a form and, I mean, part and parcel of the constitutional aspirations. In other words, sovereign, democratic, republic and secular, these are the four fundamental guidelines of our constitution. When we talk about sovereign, what does it connote? Sovereign means the power to govern people is vested in the state. That is called sovereign authority. Whenever you say sovereign authority, which means we are referring to the government. 
where from the government has the power the constitution has given the power but for the constitution the sovereign authority has no power to govern people what do you mean by democratic where people participation is fundamental by the people to the people for the people in every respect the governance please remember the word governance is not merely for those who are governing governance for those who are to be governed that's where people assume lot of significance therefore whenever we talk about democracy the people participation is fundamental then comes the most significant one republic what do you mean by republican form of government where the president of india is elected either directly or indirectly say for instance president of india he is not elected directly means what unlike us president indian president we don't cast votes we don't but the representatives whom we have elected they in turn vote whether for x y or z as a presidential candidate who are they member of members of parliament member of legislative assembly member of legislative council members of rajya sabha all put together they constitute the electoral college and they in turn vote whether a person is to be president of india or not the process where the president of india is election either directly or indirectly it is called republic and that is the reason why january 26th who hoists the flag president of india august 15th who hoists the flag prime, prime minister. minister prime minister represents the political executive the president represents the the republic executive that is the person who is the front face of the republic form of government that is the president of india okay the chief executive officer of democratic country is the president of india the political executive is prime minister that is how the constitution has identified the role and responsibility of the president of india and the prime minister prime minister is always directly elected please remember he may be indirectly elected by mlc etc but within 6 months he must seek a direct election from the lok sabha for any given constituency otherwise the person cannot continue as a prime minister please remember in other words the essential difference here we are talking about the republican form of government indicating the election of president either directly or indirectly okay and finally comes the most important expression that is secular form of government what do we mean by secular where the ruling that is the government has no official religion the ruling state is always neutral when it comes to religion can anybody give me where the ruling state has an official religion nepal nepal, nepal. Pakistan. pakistan here we are talking in terms of where an element of i mean that's the kind of distinct to here a democratic form of government only nepal is a democratic form of government I mean, at least now but still the government has that secular I mean they don't have secular notion what is that they are for a particular religion and they propagate they promote and they participate for example indian government indian government has no religion please remember the indian state is neutral to any particular religion that is the reason why according to constitution of india it is for the individual to decide which religion he or she wants to show faith nobody can come in your way you have to do this or you have to do this nobody can impose because it's your fundamental right in other words secular is something a very important uh, the, the what you call tenet of our constitutional governance where the ruling government is neutral to any particular religion or all the religions it has no official religion republican form of government where the president is elected directly or indirectly democratic form of government where the people participation is fundamental and sovereign means the power to govern a particular country or a state is given by the constitutional power without which a state cannot rule either a province or a state or central government etc etc these are the four important guidelines they are 
envisaged in the document called constitution of india all these four guidelines what i mentioned to you they are con i mean they are con uh, written in the first part of the constitution of india called preamble if you read the preamble all these four guidelines are very very clear now in the light of this we need to look into what are the various other aspects which are incorporated or which are envisaged in the constitution of india i would say there are five important aspects which are governed by the constitution of india which every one of us it doesn't matter which profession we belong to to begin with form of governance constitution of india gives all the details relating to what kind of governance structure we have what is the framework second one the most significant part fundamental rights then comes the most important one another important area directive principles directive principles of state policy the vision of dr ambedkar dr b r ambedkar who drafted the constitution he said it is not only recognition of individual rights on the part of individual beings we should also recognize the welfare of the community at large you appreciate for the welfare of the community certain steps that are required to be taken by the governments which are being elected by those people for instance health and hygiene environment protection these are the issues which apply not to the individual alone they are applicable to the community providing potable drinking water providing pollution less environment health measures for example every one of us we require public health measure in all these circumstances the i mean dr b r ambedkar felt along with the fundamental rights please remember fundamental rights are individual specific individually every one of us we are entitled to certain rights 1 2 3 4 in a qualified manner but when it comes to community the next chapter that is part 4 direct principles of state policy says government has to take these steps 1 2 3 4 in that one such step is for example uh, removal of untouchability that is one of the direct principles of state policy direct principles of state policy please remember they are guiding lights indicating informing the governments these are the things you must do because it is in the interest of everybody in the community then comes the most significant one fundamental duties it is not only rights every one of us we are worried about our rights but who is going to talk about our duties environment protection is not something in the air it is up to you to maintain to protect and promote what are you doing and finally i think uh, this is one area which we need to know very very clearly about the constitution that is constitutional structures or organizations or bodies like the planning commission we need to know what is a planning commission and what kind of responsibility it shoulders similarly finance commission or various other bodies which are created for the purpose or welfare of the people national minorities commission or national women's commission national children commission what are these bodies for what purpose they have been created please remember in order to achieve the constitutional goal which we have which we have ourselves identified you require various structures in order to achieve those goals and accordingly these bodies have been created you need to know so that you will understand in what way the constitutional scheme is put into operation in different sectors okay there are various other areas also which are there but for our purpose i thought these five areas are important to get a glimpse of essential glimpse of what the constitutional law is all about when we talk about healthcare professionals okay to begin with let us talk in terms of form of governance there are three tier governance structure that is available three layered the constitutional power is divided into three ways executive power legislative power judicial power i am not referring to the constitutional power what i am referring is form of governance whenever anybody asks you about the form of governance about india 
technically which the constitution itself did not use but many commentators even supreme court also in several cases identified it is called quasi federal means what it is not purely a federal form of government like us bharat how do you define in english union of india in english also i mean case law also for example uh, dr xyz versus union of india indian government is you i mean known or labeled as union of india the reason is the here the nature of the government that is quasi federal in character it is not purely federal it is not purely unitary in nature it is a mix of both we have state governments on one hand and we have union government also for example in uh, usa that is united states of america each state they have all the aspects are covered at the same time certain aspects the federal form of government but in india please remember no doubt the entire governance administration etc is divided between the state i mean uh, central government and state government but if you look into it is not purely federal where for everything the kind of uh, what you call uh, states have been given immense power no the central government control is there given the constitutional framework it is very clear that there are certain areas where state government has complete administrative control there are certain areas where the central government has complete control some areas where both state and central also will have the control to that effect i hope you are aware if you look into the central government on one hand state government on the other hand for instance when we talk about the central government here the state government parallel structures have been recognized by the parallel constitution of india how in what way for instance if you talk about legislature lok sabha rajya sabha judiciary supreme court executive please remember cabinet headed by prime minister as the political okay the republican executive is president of india same thing gets reflected here in state government cabinet headed by cm political executive otherwise the president of india nominee governor legislature legislative assembly legislative council high court and subordinate judiciary that is how the please remember the constitutional governance scheme they are divided between the central government and state government then you may ask a question jogara how anybody will decide whether a particular matter will it come under central government purview or state government purview for that constitution of india has a very interesting recommendation they have the lists of governance central list state list concurrent list central list means the areas which come under the purview of central government state list means the areas which come under the purview of state list concurrent list means both put together now you give me an example central list give me one example excellent next state health next ah that's what see when we talk in terms of it comes a public health for example certain aspects they come under center and concurrent as well for example education you take education comes under state i hope you are aware the capitation fee etc the ragging all these enactments they are all state uh, uh, I mean enacted laws but at the same time centrally sponsored educational institutions also we have yes. iam so, no no not only uh, primary education higher education iams iits central universities including schooling for example cbse central board of secondary education in that way the education aspect please remember we have uh, matriculation given by the university recognized by the state 
or CBHC 10th class. Parallel structures we have, depending upon. In other words, the state list very clearly defined as to what are the areas where the state government has the role. For instance, police. Police comes under state. Police doesn't come under central government, please remember. Ministry of Home Affairs, it has its own targeted areas. For example, CBA comes under central government, but not under state government. In that way, the state list, concurrent list and central list makes it as far as possible. You as a voter, whom do you elect? You elect both member of parliament and also legislative assembly, MLA, both. MLA is a person who looks after in terms of concerns of your own urge. Member of Parliament is concerned about the national import. Okay, that's how the striking balance. But there is one more structure. They are called local self-government. If you consider these two executive and legislature, local self-government also, it is at a district level. You appreciate even the local self-government. For example, Bangalore, I can give you the... Uh, example, BBMP, Bruhat Bangalore Mahanagar Palike, that is an organization which is concerned about our daily hygiene, drinking water, the cleaning, all other aspects, okay? There, two heads are there. One is the executive and one is political. Who is the executive? The Bangalore Municipal Corporation Commissioner, who is an IAS cadre. The political is a mayor who is elected by the members in a particular ward. Who is the person who represents a ward? Corporator. Either corporator in turn they elect mayor or mayor may get elected directly. Depending upon the state they have their own approaches. Municipality we say councillor and chairman. There also it is called special officer. Panchayat. Panchayati and members of the panchayat. Panchayati president. And when it comes to the panchayat secretary, all this very clearly indicates either in the central government level or in the state government level or in the local self-government level. That's where the governance structure operates at three levels. For instance, whether you are getting drinking water supply or not, that is an issue to be addressed at the local self-government. Some kind of health problem is there. What needs to be done? That is at the... Suppose when we talk in terms of an issue which concerns and governs related to people living in the state, then the state. Which is a matter of national importance, then central. That is how the governance structure that operates. Okay? Now, I have explained everything except judiciary. Now, I, have to, I need to tell you, whenever we talk about judiciary, starting from the lowest court, the lowest in the rung of the judiciary, that's what we call... Judicial Magistrate of First Class, JMFC. Judicial Magistrate is the judge who looks after a particular jurisdiction of a taluk panchayat. Taluk in a panchayat. JMFC is the judge who has a particular jurisdiction to try civil and criminal cases. Followed by Chief Judicial Magistrate. Followed, I mean followed means upper in the rear. Okay? Then comes the district and session judge. Every district will have a district and session judge. Please remember, the same judge will decide civil matters and criminal cases. Then, above, high court. Okay? High court, supreme court. In India, there is only one supreme court. In provincial and state level, we do not call it a supreme court. We call it a high court. For example, in US, the state has a Supreme Court. And federal Supreme Court is also there. In India, we don't have such structures. Starting from magistrate court till the district and session in the district level. High court in the state capital or some other place in the state capital or in addition to state capital. Then followed by Supreme Court. I hope you are aware, Supreme Court as of now, we do not have any bench. Supreme Court is the highest judicial organ, please remember, whose responsibility and duty, constitutional duty is 
to interpret the laws and render justice. That is the duty. Please remember, whenever we talk about the division of powers, I told you the constitutional power is divided into three organs, executive, legislature, judiciary. Judiciary is meant to interpret law and render justice. That's all. <clears throat> legislature, the main responsibility is a democratic deliberations. In the house, we will have debates, etc. And lawmaking. The act, the law, the code, whenever a law is to be made, please remember, it is to be either three different levels. For instance, your central budget, whenever it is delivered on February 28th or 27th, that is a law. Okay? That is passed in the Lok Sabha and Raj Sabha, then President of India gives concurrence. Then it becomes an act. Okay? Similarly, the budget passed in legislative assembly. And accordingly, the legislative assembly, and if there is a legislative council, and a governor, and accordingly. Similarly, in the case of panch I mean, uh, municipal corporation, municipality, and panchayat as well. Why I am giving this example is, each and every aspect so minutely discussed and uh, envisaged in the constitution of India. That's the reason it's very important for us to know the entire governance takes place in such a detailed, envisaged manner. Okay? When it comes to all the three organs, please remember, judiciary, interpreting law, rendering justice, legislature, lawmaking, executive, please remember, the policy formulation and legal implementation. You formulate the policy and you make the law in legislature and you are responsible for implementation of the law. I will give an example so that you appreciate what is a policy formulation and what is law making. Is there a difference? If so, what kind of, what is the difference? Kidney transplantation or human organ transplantation. Difference between policy and the law. Policy, what is that? Kidney or human organ transplantation is possible provided there is no commercial dealing. That is policy. Yeah, okay? You same thing. Okay. We have a law as well. In the year 1994, the central government passed a legislation. The government, the law says very clearly, a near blood relative can donate kidney. See, whenever there is a my brother or sister, I mean not sister, my father or mother, naturally they are concerned about my life, the quality of life, they may come forward to donate the kidney. It is called altruistic ideology. That is for the welfare of the other. That is called altruism. If for that purpose, the person can do it. But if a unrelated person wants to give, please remember, it is not allowed. Unless it is shown that he is giving only for the sake of this, etc., etc., and there is no money or commercial dealing that is allowed. Which means the policy is conceived by the executive. The executive is responsible for policy. Another example you take. Whether reservation is to be given for OBC or not, the concerned minister HRD, he comes out with the particular political manifesto, ideology, these, that, etc., etc. Yes, there is a need for giving or extending reservation to the particular people belong to that caste. That is policy. Law means you have to enact a specific law which is written, which is codified, and which is passed by the Member, uh, House of the Legislature, that is Lok Sabha and Raj Sabha. Okay? Policy is always a broader outlook, an overview. Law means specific details. Okay? Specific details. Should it be or should it not be? Yesterday, our friend, in fact, I was telling my office that you have uh, raised this question. Presently, I am involved in writing a book on RTI. Therefore, when you asked about the RTI, I told my colleagues, uh, I am really surprised that a medical doctor asking a question about RTI, that shows how general public is also aware about the right to information. You will be surprised to know the enactment which has been passed in the parliament as a consequence of UPA manifesto. That is the law, legislation. But the policy was entirely... Many people felt, why do we require RTA, right to information? 
Our right to information is always recognized under Article 19.1a, right to freedom of speech and expression as a fundamental right. In addition to that, why do we require? Then people mentioned, no, right to information acts as an antidote for various social evils. For example, corruption, corruption in public life. Right to information provides the sunshine. Sunshine is the best disinfectant. That is the reason why the administration must be transparent in nature. Therefore, anybody, every person is entitled to seek right. That is a policy. The discussion about the significance, the need, why do we require in a democratic form of government, that is policy. In that way, judiciary, legislature, executive, at central level, at state level, and at local self-government level. Any doubts, comments, observations? Are you clear? Okay. Then comes the most important one, fundamental rights. My dear friends, fundamental rights, majority, they are applicable, they are relevant to citizens only. However, there are certain fundamental rights which are applicable to persons. The individual may not be Indian citizen, but still she can seek a fundamental right. I want you to understand the differentiation. As an Indian citizen, you are entitled to majority of the fundamental. Our friend is not Indian citizen. That does not mean they do not have fundamental rights the moment they step into this country. There are certain very crucial, significant fundamental rights which are applicable to you. They are also applicable to persons. When we say person, who is a non-citizen? That is the difference. Okay? Now, according to Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the conferment of a fundamental right on the citizen oblique persons of India, it is a long-drawn struggle, the kind of victimization the kind of ill treatment, the kind of citizenry involvement that was during the independence struggle, many people realize that for the overall fulfillment of a human being, the libertarian doctrine very clearly says the right of an individual must be recognized. Unless and until you recognize and confer the right on an individual, the fulfillment may not take place. Therefore, in a democratic form of government, it is fundamental that the rights of fundamental nature must be conferred on citizens and persons. That is how part three of our constitution of India identifies several fundamental rights, but I think most notable I would uh, specifically mention, for instance, Article 19.1a, that is, fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression. Article 21. Right to life and personal liberty. Article 25, right to religion. Article 14, right to equality. Article 16, right to employment. Article 15, right against discrimination as a woman. Women cannot be discriminated merely on the ground that she is a woman. In other words, these are the very specific fundamental rights which are recognized and incorporated in the Constitution of India. They are very, very significant. However, the most important point which you need to understand is, fundamental rights, though they are fundamental in nature, but they are not absolute in character. Please remember, under no circumstance a fundamental right can be construed as absolute. No. It is for the simple reason, right to freedom of speech and expression, that does not mean I defame my colleague. Is it uh, permissible? Should it be permitted? Right to life and personal liberty does not mean I create nuisance to my colleague. No, not at all. Right to religion does not mean I show disrespect to your religion. No, not at all. The tolerance, that is the crux of the movement in a democratic country. In other words, no doubt fundamental rights are fundamental in nature. However, they are subject to certain conditions. They are qualified in nature. They are not absolute. As a result, every one of us, we need to be very careful. No doubt we have, but there may be circumstances where they can be constricted or restricted. Under certain 
Can you give me an example where your fundamental rights or rather our fundamental rights have been restricted? Ah. Emergency. When emergency was declared, please remember, this, that, that's the, you need to know what is happening. In emergency when it was declared, I wouldn't say that we were not allowed to live. No, I wouldn't say. But definitely the rights were restricted. You cannot do 1, 2, 3, 4. You shall not do 1, 2, 3, 4. You cannot go to the Supreme Court and say, no, this is violative of fundamental right. You cannot ask. Because the situation was that emergency was proclaimed. Fundamental duties and fundamental rights, they talk in terms of individual orientation. Okay? And finally, the constitutional structures. Friends, Constitution of India has envisaged a lot of ideals, lot of desired goals. But in order to achieve that, you have to appreciate the contextual, the social milieu. I mean, that's why I always say, law on paper is different from law in practice. Always please remember, law on paper is different from law in practice. Law on paper always sounds sonorous. It sounds very well. If you read the section, it sounds beautiful. But whether it is being practiced, how far, to what extent? I think the best possible example in our own cultural context, dowry prohibition laws, which were enacted roughly 50 years ago. 1961, amended 10 times. But you know the culture. It is not merely you blame either a politician or a policeman. or it, it includes everybody. Everybody has to shoulder their own responsibility. I mean, what I want to tell you is, I just always give a small example for my students whenever I talk about law. I say, for example, what is this? Correct? Dog. Dog barks. Any doubt? It may not bite, but definitely it barks. But the word dog doesn't bark. You understood? The word dog doesn't bark. Law is like that. Law, word, doesn't make sense. You may read, you may write, doesn't make sense. Unless adequate practical enforcement takes place, law has no value. Fundamental. Suppose I say that I have a right to health, but if I get some kind of illness, there is no place where I can go and seek health care. What, what, what kind of right I am talking? Doesn't make sense. Therefore, please remember, law in practice is something which is very, very crucial. That's where operationalization of the laws, the rights, in a country like ours, assumes a lot of significance. Towards this purpose only, various structures, organizations, bodies have been created. They may not act maybe on account of individual to individual, but definitely a group or a particular sector. For example, you take, there are so many people who are basically, they may not be able to compete with the rest. I will just give an example. I am not saying that in a given situation, one woman or one woman, no, generally I am speaking. For example, you take women generally gender, children, disabled people. Now we stopped calling them as disabled. I hope you are there. Or, no, one more. Differently able. Ah, differently able. Differently enabled. No, 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 differently able. Not unable. I would say enabled. No, it is able. For example, with two hands and two legs, I only do two things. But with one hand and one leg, they do four things. I have seen people. That is the reason why I told even in National Epilepsy meeting, I said the phrase the disabled is disgusting. You need to identify, he may not appear like you, she may not like to talk the way you talk, but still she has an ability which the rest of us we may not have. Therefore, differently abled, that is the expression, differently abled, women, children, oppressed sectors like SC, ST. Okay, and now we started realizing that uh, people like uh, PLWHAs, people living with HIV AIDS, 
communities of people, we started, I mean, we realized that the protection, what is aimed, what is envisaged, it never reaches them. Unless and until there is a particular structure which is created to look into. That is how constitution of India scheme, if you examine, they felt that depending upon the need and social contingency, a particular structure can be created in order to propagate, in order to look into, in order to conduct even inquiry. That's how National Human Rights Commission was established. National Human Rights Commission is one very important body which is created under the Constitution of India. And Human Rights Enactment also 1993 has been uh, passed by the Parliament of India. <coughs> Similarly, National Commission for Women, National Commission for Minorities, National Commission for Children, which was recently established. All these bodies put together the socio-political and economic context like Planning Commission, Finance Commission, etc. Even Constitutional Review Committee, it is not a commission because a committee is not a permanent body. Please remember, committee is always constituted for a particular purpose. Commission has a longevity more. They have a tenure, five years, you have a new chairperson, new etc. For example, NHRC, National Human Rights Commission. Commission is a permanent body. It is created under the legislation. And accordingly, every five years, the retired Chief Justice of India will be the chairperson of NHRC in that way. But when it comes to the committees, etc., various committees have been identified. The sole reason is that when Constitution of India envisages so many welfare schemes, so many measures of a public upliftment, public interest, whether in fact they are reaching the needy or not, how do we know? That is what operationalization. Now, with this we conclude the essential five areas of constitutional law.